Good evening, everybody. Please take a seat just for a moment. And a very warm welcome to Spring Harvest Skegness 1994. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. You will go down in history as the Spring Harvest crowd that brought the sunshine. Well done. Now, it would be really good to know amongst this vast, intelligent, good-looking and spiritual crowd, who has been to Spring Harvest before? Put your hand in the air. Okay, put them down again, please. Who has been to every single Spring Harvest that ever has moved? There are a few of them. Look at that. Well done. Long service awards for you. Who has never been, who, for whom is this your first spring harvest? Please put your hand up. Hey, look, there's a whole lot of them. Well done. Welcome. A warm welcome. We're in for a really good week this week. Noel Richards and his band leading worship. He introduced himself, but give him a welcome as well and his band. Thank you, Noel. And evening by evening, there will be one, two, three, four, five of us on this platform helping to lead the celebration. So I'm going to get Roger Forster, Pete Meadows, Christine Noble, myself, and the Invisible Man to stand, please. So please give a round of applause to the four of them and to me, which makes five. The problem is with the jacket in the middle, that he sent his jacket on ahead. He is coming tonight. And so, in his absence, uh, his name is... Hang on a sec. What did you say the name was? Pardon? Okay. Dunn. Oh, yeah, Dunn. That's right, I see that. It's actually Gerald Coates. <laughs> Peter Meadows. Christine Noble, Roger Forster, who's going to be bringing us the Bible readings evening by evening, and myself, Rob White. But it's really good to see you. Thank you. Do sit down, all four of you. Please go on, shove off, mate. You're always hanging around the place. Right. Now, I think it'd be good if you spoke to one another for a moment. So why don't you do the most sensible thing? That is, very, very briefly, ask somebody their name. Ask somebody from whence they have come. In other words, where they live. Then, I've noticed that many of you have got little spring harvest stickers in the back of your windows. I used to think, if you've come by car that is, I used to think they were there to tell other people you've been to spring harvest, but I now realise they are there to help you cut down your speed. Because, who can speed with a spring harvest sticker in their back window? So when you ask somebody where they come from, what their name is, ask them, did you, did you marginally break the speed limit because you were so excited to get here, right? And then the fourth question is, what do you expect God to do for you this spring harvest? Okay, go to it just a couple of minutes. And I'm going to come down and find out from one or two of you what you said. Okay, quick shot. You'll have to listen very carefully because I'm going to ask you not what your answers are, but what the answers of the person you've just met are. Okay.
Okay, folks, you must have found out by now. So if you'd like to listen very carefully, somebody will be introduced to you. And I'm standing right here in this aisle looking at a very, very, very marvellous group of people. I'm going to ask the lady who is not looking at me on purpose, thinking if I don't look, he won't ask me. But it works in reverse. Could you introduce me to one of the people you've met and give me the honest truth about them? And that's the first one at Spring Harvest. My sim very friendly couple. Um, Be Bel Belda. 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 Uh, Belton. God, I have to choose the wrong one to start. Bel I'm sorry about that. Belton, where do you come from? Norway. Hey, how about that? Give her a. That's great. Oh, I say she didn't. And what's she hoping to get out of Spring Harvest? Didn't get that far. Is there anybody down here that found out what somebody they were talking to hopes that God's going to do for them at Spring Harvest? Put your hand up. There must be somebody. Okay, here's one. Hang on. Yes. And uh, what, what is this person hoping that God will do for them at Spring Harvest? Right, it's my friend behind me here. His name is Tidair. It's the Welsh name. He's from Ammonford in Carnarvon. And uh, he's hoping simply to learn, gain more knowledge about the Lord. Well, I think that's great, don't you? It's longing to gain more knowledge about the Lord. Thank you very much. Well, I'd love to come and ask every one of you, but we don't have the time. So I'm going to leave it there, which will save your embarrassment and my legs. And I really think that sums it up, what Didier said, that he's longing to learn more about the Lord, and we all are. So before we go any further, I'm going to ask Noel to lead us in a great hymn, which is another hymn about the resurrection and the glory of God, and I bet you all know it. Thine be the glory, risen conquering sun. It's number 135. So let's stand and sing this hymn as an opening hymn of praise. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, to this time, most evenings, we will be doing important things like telling you what's going on, and mostly what isn't going on, and where what you really want to see is move to. That's the way Spring Harvest works. Uh, they did bring the good weather, Christine, yes. Well, there were two people here last year and the year before who somewhat disgraced themselves and they were banished. Uh, well, Dave Pope and Clive Calver have such a deep prayer life that rain does tend to follow them, Christine. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, if you want to know where the sun has come from, it's come from Minehead. And if, and, you, and if you want to know where the rain has gone to, it's gone to Minehead, yes. Yes. The ducks are drowning in Minehead. So there'll be a prayer time for Minehead and its weather a little later on. Meanwhile, a spirit of smugness has broken out over the whole of Stegman. Those who've been every year would remember some of the yes. interesting titles that Spring Harvest have had. They're all expecting a power cut. I think this is what. Uh, what do you think the hour would be like on disco in the lights? Oh, his mother's in again. <laughs> Well, our, our subject is the church, as I'm sure you know. And we wanted a title that sounded a bit more exciting than the church. Of course, the church should be exciting. It's just that somehow it doesn't always sound as exciting as it really ought to be. Um, and uh, I was, as usual, asked to come up with a title. And to be honest, I wanted to call it the Frankenstein Factor. <laughs> 
Well, they said I couldn't because we'd get letters. And I said, we'll get letters anyway. I said, we always get letters. They said, we'll get lots more letters than usual. They said, why? I said, well, look, I said, the reason I want to call it the Frankenstein Factory is that I, I remember seeing this Boris Karloff movie, which is in black and white, and there's this wonderful scene in it where the, where the, the monster, the sort of the, the humanoid that, that, uh, that the mad professor has made has been emerged into life, and he's stumbling through the mist. And, you know, apart from the bolt in his neck, he's sort of, I thought, he's, like all the, he's a body, and all the bits are there, joined up vaguely in the right places, but not quite. And he doesn't know where he's going, how he got there, or why he's there. And I thought, that sounds too much like the church. I mean, yes. Well, there are some strange women around, that's all I can say, really. Well, well in, in, in the end, having been told we couldn't call it the Frankenstein factor, I thought, well, what, what is there about it? Well, having been told we couldn't do that, I then thought, well, I wanted to then call it Assembled in the Dark. Because, sort of assembled and dark, and, you know, if you put something in the dark, you know, you might, it's like if you put a piece of MFI furniture together in the dark. And that's a bad illustration, because it looks the same if you put it on in the light. But. <laughs> But, but, but the, the principle's there. In the end, you put the lights on and you say, oh. And I think many of us come to Spring Harvest recognizing that what we know the church ought to be like isn't what we're like. And uh, so dancing in the dark is, is that picture that we may have a new life of the Spirit come, but do we really understand why God has sent us here and what our purpose is? Or if we have got our act together, are we just dancing for our own pleasure? Or are we really out there dancing in the dark places? So we've got a... Uh, a main seminar program that's looking at us as, as people, as partners, uh, our problems, and there'll be one or two of those in our churches, I guess, it's usually us, and then uh, purpose. We're beginning each day with a, a morning devotional time together, uh, which, is, which is taking sort of elements of prayer and family worship together in one place, and starting with a kind of very short focus for the day, and you can choose to do that either before breakfast or after breakfast, or just miss your breakfast altogether. Um, then you, then the second part of the morning after the main seminars, and you choose those dependent on your intelligent quotient. You know, you just actually, I would rather go to a thicko subject and pretend to be clever. I'm, you know, I'll be, I'll be daily mailing, even though I'm, you know, I'm really a Beano fan myself. I mean, that's that's roughly where we'll be. Hmm? Well, I'm pretending, you know. And then we've got uh, optional seminars in the afternoons. And then in the evening, we've got three celebrations. And what we've done this year, for those who are regulars, we've taken the Bible readings, which are usually in the mornings, and put them into the evening. So we're going to expound Scripture together, but in the context of worship. And there are three uh, celebrations to choose from. There's the Big Top. Um, there's one which is slightly wilder and is even more youth-friendly in the gaiety. And one for who those who'd like to take life a little more steadily and be a bit more reflective in their worship, which is in a wonderful place called the Enchanted Castle. And if you're sitting in your chalet particularly now, too frightened to go out, that's definitely the place to go to. Um, we really want to see all these venues for terrific worship, good leadership, good preaching and exposition. That's, that's roughly the program for the week, Christine. Is the spring getting older? Uh, well, we, we are, Christine. Say that again slowly. Ten grandchildren? Oh, my life. You do work hard, Christine. It's very impressive. What's this thing the We've got three special streams within the seminars this, this year. Uh, a special focus for those who are over 55. They say there is life after 55. And that's uh, been built into the program. There's one on developing your spiritual life and one on arts and media. And it's very important tonight that if you want to lock into any one of those three streams, whether you've pre-registered for that or not, if you haven't pre-registered, you can still join. But there are special orientation meetings tonight. I think it's 9.30 at various venues which are probably going on overheads now wonderfully by the people who are doing the good job. So, that's, so whether you're registered for those or not, get in there and start getting the program off to a good start.
the answer is, have your breakfast tonight, because you'll be too busy tomorrow. <laughs> we have some bits of information to give, as usual. Let's, uh, what have you got to start with? I, I didn't nick your. Did I nick your notice? I'm sorry. No, no, I, I've done it now. No, I, I guess. I guess it's like spring. Oh, you sort of wander around and find it. And talk they'll, among yourselves. They'll put it on the notice board. A, a very special visitor is here with us just for today and tomorrow. He's the, he's the president of the Evangelical Alliance, Sir Fred Catherwood, who has been the vice chairman of the... Uh, yes, give him a welcome. He's around somewhere. And we, where are you, Sir Fred? Just stand somewhere. He is here. He is there. Okay. As vice president of the Evangelical Alliance, he's doing a tremendous and valuable job. His background has not only been in industry and commerce, but also significantly as Vice Chair of the European Parliament. And he's here to give a special address tomorrow as part of the I Believe series, looking at uh, under the subject of I Believe in God's Order for Society. If you want to leave here understanding the significant time in history that the church in Britain faces, uh, the agenda before us, the failure of the, the politicians to, to address it, and the responsibility and opportunities for the church, do not miss Sir Fred's, I believe. Those who've been there at it at previous Spring Harvest Weeks have spoken very highly. And if you're not able to get there or get in, then make sure you order the tape and take this back to your church. Christine, every, uh, every week, every night, we uh, mention a book or two, not because we get any royalties or profits, but simply because we want to make resources available to you as you come. And the one we're focusing on tonight is called Operation World. But it's a special deal. Many of you will know it's a, it's a way to pray for the nations of the world, to get a clear understanding as, as, as where they are in their progress towards God, what their particular needs are. And normally, this uh, Operation World costs 50, uh, nearly 16 pounds. It's a detailed, updated study. We've got it available here at Spring Harvest for nine pounds 99, and it's shrink-wrapped with a free world map, so you can stick it up and really get prayer going. It's got recent data on political changes, updates on 49 entries on new countries, and enables you to be involved in global mission. Now, mission and Christian responsibility will be an emphasis here tonight as we preach and respond. So here's a very practical way to go forward. Christine, anything more from you? Are we no, done? No. I see that Mr. Have... Coates has arrived. Oh, he has arrived, So yes. we'd just like to have a little bow forward. We can see he that he does arrived. exist and is real. Yes. That's enough, Gerald. That's Thank you very much. Just oh, thank you very much. Good. And don't we have a couple of guests now? Well, I've got a couple of guests, yes. The question I wanted to ask is, if you think back on your church and wonder how you would face if uh, your church wasn't the, the thriving, wonderful you know, activity that it is, but it was under pressure. Uh, this week we're looking at uh, the church through the, the book of Philippi, and I would, we were just thinking about a church where it's uh, actually based uh, on the front line of the former Yugoslavia conflict. Uh, where the building uh, ha is regularly struck with missiles and shrapnel and shells, where when people meet within the building, very often during a service they have to simply stop in order to hear themselves uh, think and pray and worship because of the noise of warfare around them. Now, we've got a couple who went and started that church a couple of years ago. They came to Spring Harvest last year and uh, they came on their honeymoon they return now, uh, over seven months pregnant. Will you please welcome Nicola and Sandra Srijanik? Come on in, you folks. Okay. Now, Sandra speaks good English, and uh, her husband speaks better English than he allows us to believe. All right. But we, we work through interpreters here. Um, folks, try and give us, I've given a very brief understanding of what your church is like. 
Describe its people to us, because you come from war-torn, what was Yugoslavia, three people groups at war with one another. Tell us what your church people are like. Because they live under the such under such a pressure, they started to behave different in the war. We are talking there about three ethnic groups together in a Mostar, in Warton City, in the part of a, a country that's called Bosnia and Herzegovina. Teško neprijateljstvo među tim ljudima, mržnja, ne može se znati pravi uzrok, jednostavno ne trpe jedni druge. Međutim, kod nas u crkvi smo vidjeli čudo da Isus Krist je na jedan mirotvoran način djelovao među ljudima i može se i mogli su proročki živjeti za ovo vrijeme sad koje dolazi. In the town, in society, we cannot see those people together because they are divided by hatred. They don't even know why they can't stand each other anymore. But in the church, we can find them uh, in equal proportion, all three, all three of them, and they are worshiping God. And we, we've seen that as a prophetic, as an as a act that only God could do in that situation. Mm, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> Would it be right to say that your church is probably the only community in the whole of your city of Mostar where the three nations are together in unity? That's right. We, we could also say that it's the only place in the whole country of Bosnia where you can find all three nationalities together. Okay. When you returned from Spring Harvest last year, um, how many were people were in your church and how many do you have now? Prošle godine je bilo 50-60 ljudi, a danas je negdje oko 150-160. About a year ago it was about 50 people. We could say up to 50 people, but now we can find more than 150-60 people circulating to the church. So that's incredible because historically, in times of war, churches decrease in number. Whereas you're seeing something quite opposite happen. Tell, tell us, Sandra, how, um, how your church is putting its Christian faith into action. Uh, well, uh, we've seen many things happen through prayer. Many, many people receive healing and uh, deliverance. And uh, uh, people from church, they are joining their, their strength, going to the hospitals. They are well received in hospitals. They, they are, uh, uh, when they come to the hospitals, uh, people from the, uh, uh, patients from the another rooms, they are asking them to come to their room to be prayed for. Um, so many activities going on. Church is very known and respected now in town for relief work. We have a group of people in church who are visiting uh, uh, handicapped people, invalids, uh, those who, who cannot go out from their homes because, because they are old and, and uh, they, they don't have enough strength to go out to take their food. And don't, haven't you got a feeding program as well? Don't you feed the hungry in the city? That's right, yes. Yeah. We, we have developed a very big feeding program through, through, our, uh, through Christians uh, all over the world. We are receiving a great amount of food. Uh, it's, it's, it's important maybe to say that the uh, uh, church was able to, uh, to in a few months' time, in the last few months, to feed every family in this side of Mostar. Mm. The young people of Spring Harvest have taken you two and your church and the city of Mostar to their heart. And uh, on day four, they will be attacking us and making sure we give them money as they earn it for, through various sponsored events. What do you hope will come out of Spring Harvest so far as, what do you hope Spring Harvest will contribute to the future of Mostar? Uh, uh, we are here uh, uh, presenting uh, program on new venues, a project called New Bridge, Novi Most. 
And uh, uh, the idea and vision of that project is uh, to help uh, en enable young people to bring reconciliation to, the, to, uh, to that nation, to that city, through, through our Christian work. And uh, uh, we, we have been already given minibus uh, that needs to be paid for from spring harvest. And we, uh, we hope to, uh, to, to get enough uh, finances to bring yeah, regular young people out of Mostar for Christian holidays to work with them. And also to train them, to equip them so they could train others and uh, they could really become light uh, to, 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 to their nations. Mm. What you two have described is a prophetic uh, vision and a prophetic statement to your nation. Here this week, we need to be seeing if we can learn some lessons from you and applying them to our own nation. So I'm going to ask if we could just be still and pray for a moment. And we have only a moment, but we have a whole week in which we can respond to this challenge, see how it needs to be reflected in our own church communities, and to take opportunities to pray for ourselves and for them. But let's pray together briefly now. Father, we thank you for this young couple. We thank you for the faithful Christians of the city of Mostow, who buried differences and stand united in the Lord Jesus. We recognize we have a couple here that when one goes out of a day, they wonder if they will ever see the other again. And yet they return to that dangerous situation to risk their lives to fulfill their calling in you. Father, we pray for them. Keep them in safety, we pray. Bless them and use them. Help us to respond to their needs and to reflect lives which they would be pleased to see in us. Bless us and help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you express your appreciation to them for being here? Thank you. I'm reading the first chapter of Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and firming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, 
whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them, and they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Well, it's a very special privilege that uh, I've been given this evening to introduce our guest, Roger Forster. Apart from those in my family in Surrey and uh, our church pioneer people, Roger Forster is one of the closest friends I've ever had and he's been one of the most influential people in my life. So he really has an awful lot to answer for one way or another. But one of the wonderful things about Roger is his knowledge and grasp of the scriptures and his ability to communicate those scriptures so clearly. But beyond that, I've seen over and over again in platforms such as this at Spring Harvest where Roger and I are given great opportunities to share the word and to minister to large crowds such as this, I do have to say that we have also shared platforms in March for Jesus and have stood many times in tears as we've seen so many thousands gather to pray for our land. And it's praying people that are going to bring about change and will be the agents of change in the world in which we live. Roger tonight will be speaking from Philippians chapter 1, tomorrow night Philippians chapter 2, Peter Meadows will be speaking on day three, and then we've asked Roger to come back and to speak on Philippians chapter three and chapter four on days four and five. And so we've got four evenings of Roger Forster where the book of Philippians, centering on the church, her nature, and her mission, is gonna be unpacked, and then Pete Meadows right in the middle. So that's gonna be a good program here in the Big Top. I want you to welcome very warmly so that we can get the very best out of him Roger Forster. Thank you very much. It's uh, lovely to be here because Faith, my wife and myself, we have been traveling from, first of all, two weeks at Minehead, then one week at Putelli. Now we've landed up at Spring Harvest Skegness, and we are very happy to be here. I won't say it's the best site, but you know, you do get those kind of feelings as you move around these places. And to see some of the old Spring Harvest Skegnessers walking around the place al already has been very heartwarming and making us feel very much at home. In fact, some of you seem to be turning up at uh, Spring Harvest with the same sort of bad habit as the Apostle Paul seemed to be turning up in prison. I don't know whether the parallels 
uh, have other things to say for us, like turning up at the gates and the wire and the barbed wire around the buildings. But anyway, there is a sort of a parallel which will help to lead us into the book of Philippians. Philippians is one of those prison epistle letters. It was written when Paul was in prison. As I say, he used to, when he had a campaign in a certain place, go there, look around, not for the nearest hotel, but for the nearest prison, because he knew he'd finish up there and you want to know the way home afterwards. <laughs> and with this kind of bad habit that he was developing, he tried to redeem the hours by writing letters, which was very useful because it meant that God communicated through those letters of the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm very glad that God did not give us a theological textbook. Uh, that would have been a very boring thing. He sent us letters. He sent us love poems, Song of Solomon, a tragic sort of poems, but really written from the heart with all the poetry of the book of Job, uh, chronicles and histories, and all sorts of books, philosophers' books like Ecclesiastes. Thank God he didn't give us a theological book. He gave us a book whereby he could communicate his heart to us. And the reason why the Apostle Paul, when in prison, redeems the time by writing these prison epistles, Philippians is one of them. Some people think he wrote it from Ephesus prison. Some people thought he wrote it from Caesarea prison. Other people think traditionally that it was from Rome. It probably was from Rome. But there he is in prison, writing these epistles and pouring out his heart. And it's when men and women pour out their hearts to God's people, the church, that God loves, that God can come through those epistles. He can come through that soul. He can reach people and touch them and change them. And that is what has been happening ever since through the Apostle Paul's writings and in particular through the epistles and through this one of the Philippians. In fact, it's rather beautiful that this one man, perhaps above any other in the history of the church, who wanted to make Christ known in every place where he'd not been preached, spent so much of his time in prison. And you might have thought to yourself, why on earth couldn't have God ordered it a little bit better than this? Here's the one man that would have evangelized the world. He would have run around into every nation. He would have found people who never heard of Christ. And he would have poured out his heart and preached Jesus to them. Why was it that God allowed him to be put in prison so many times? And yet that one man who cried out, Lord, I would love to pray. This is my great ambition, is to make Christ known where he's not been made known. Isn't it wonderful that he's still doing it today? Because every time this book, every time this epistle gets translated, into every tribe, tongue, kindred, people, and nation, the Apostle Paul is fulfilling that great heart ambition to preach Christ where he wasn't named. And God won't put one great hunger and longing in your heart without fulfilling it, probably on a level that you would never have imagined, but with an intensity that will cause the world ultimately to glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it means to plant seeds and reap a harvest. That's what it means to have the faith of mustard seed. Believe your God, even when everything seems to be against you. When you seem to be in prison, cabin, crib, confined, to quote the prophet, I mean Shakespeare, sorry. When you're in that position, you can't get anywhere. You call upon God. What you put in my heart, get it out, Lord. And he will, in a way beyond whatever you could imagine. Well, that's nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, so... We better turn. I'm glad that you've got the epistle to the Philippians open by this stage. Paul wrote it first and foremost because he just wanted to write it. Because he loved the Philippians. My heart longs for you. And every time I think of you, I pray for you. This is a epistle of longing and love. That's the way to write letters. Secondly, he wrote it because he wanted them to know news about himself. Thirdly, he wanted to warn them of the Judaizers who introduced the law and destroyed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. More of them later in the week. Fourthly, or fifthly, I'm losing count, he wrote to them because he wanted them to stand in the midst of persecution. And we're going to think tonight that any church that means business with God to fulfill the Great Commission, to fulfill the mission that's been laid upon the church, will be a church that will find itself persecuted and having to push through against great odds to see the good news proclaimed in all the world. And he tells them, you've seen the conflict in me. Now I know I stand together with you in this same struggle for the gospel. And we're going to only get this good news through the world as we go together in struggle with it to push to the very ends of the earth. 
That is Paul's great hunger for these Philippians. He again wants to write to them because Epaphroditus was a man from Philippi who'd been sent to Paul while he was there in prison in Rome. He'd probably done a few jobs from around the prison house because he was confined in house imprisonment and he'd probably need somebody to help him. Need a little bit of food, God, as well, because in those days in prison, if somebody didn't bring you any food, they just let you starve. So Epaphroditus had come with a gift from the Philippians and Paul wants to write back and tell the Philippians not so much thank you for the gift as you might have thought because he doesn't exactly say that when you look carefully but he says thank you for your love that you've got concern over me again I didn't really need the gift you don't usually write thanking for gifts like that do you we didn't I didn't really need the gift I've learned whether I'm exalted or I'm abased whether I have all and I'm abound and I'm full or whether I'm empty I have a mind which is contented to rejoice in Christ so it was nice though that you have renewed your love for me because it means that you're planting something for which there will be a return from God you cannot give you cannot share you cannot pour your heart out for others in love without there being a return the returns of love are assured by the promise of Jesus there always will be that return in our spiritual lives and developments more of that on the last night he's writing to them also because he has heard that there are certain divisions amongst them and he wants to help them to get those divisions straight if there's one simple way that the devil has known for 2,000 years to hinder God's purposes being fulfilled in the church is to get division is to get people arguing with each other and kicking each other around instead of kicking the enemy around I'm sick to death of Christians kicking each other around aren't you there aren't enough of us to do that but the devil's there and we have been told we've got authority to kick him out cast out demons preach good news heal the sick and go into all the world so if we used our energy in the right direction we might be getting on with the job a lot times faster than all the time arguing and bickering with one another so Paul writes them and says come on cool it down a couple of ladies called odious and soon touchy or something like that you'll find them there when we get there and get it together and start living nicely once more because you disunity is the finest way to paralyze God's purposes for his people and finally he wants them to rejoice 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 and we're going to see that that little word occurs 16 times in this four chapters now that's a kind of introduction a bit more quick introduction you'll see it come up on the screen oh wait a minute we've got here we've gone there rather fast let's go back one I said thank God that he wrote to us in epistles and gospels and not in theolo theological tomes theological textbooks but here is some ologies nonetheless not theology but missiology christology soteriology ecclesiology no need to get up and go at this point you'll soon find out what those things mean <laughs> missiology is the study of world mission the purpose for which the church of christ was brought into being we have a mission and when the church loses its mission it loses its raison d'etre which is just a French way of saying it's reason for living. Thank you. Secondly, we're going to look at the second chapter of Philippians, and we're going to see what is called Christology. That is the study of Christ. We're going to look at Christ who outgods every God and who outmans head and shoulders above any man. He who was in the form of God thought it not something to hang on to, to be equal with God, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being found in the fashion of man and, and in the likeness of men. He became obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, might confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth having a mission for. Jesus is worth pouring your life out for. There is no body like him. And that's Christology. And we're going to look at this most wonderful of all persons that exist in heaven or in earth. Chapter 2. Chapter 3, Soteriology. That's just a Greek way of saying the doctrine of salvation. The original Greek. You'll meet the original Greek one day. He's a rather... <laughs> interesting character and you'll find out that every time your pastor said in the original Greek that it wasn't that at all really anyway <laughs> soteriology is the doctrine of salvation and salvation isn't so much an ABC how to get saved 
It isn't so much a doctrine of how I can get all my psychology ironed out so that I've got a perfectly balanced and blessed psychology. The funny thing is that God seems to use eccentrics more than anybody else to get on with the world work, but anyway, I, with all sorts of funny crinkles that never get ironed out, doesn't seem to worry him too much. Now, that isn't salvation. Salvation is knowing Christ. Paul says that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain to the out-resurrection of the dead. And so I press on in knowing him, in knowing the power of his resurrection, knowing the fellowship of his sufferings, in being conformed to the image of his death. Why do I keep pressing on for the prize of the upward calling, which is, God, is, my, is in Christ Jesus, is longing and is reach, I'm reaching forward to get hold of it, to make it mine. This one thing I do. Salvation is an ongoing getting to know Jesus. And when you stop wanting to know Jesus, then you have finished with salvation. When you go on hungry to know Jesus, year after year after year after decade after decade after, well, as some of us, it's century after century, you just long to know more of him. That's soteriology. And we're going to think about the doctrine of salvation. Fourthly, when we get to the end, chapter 4, or the last couple of verses, chapter 3 and chapter 4, we're going to have some thoughts about the church, some study about the church. Ecclesiology, as most of you realize, is to do with the study of the church. And ecclesiology, that's the theme really of this whole spring harvest, is to try and understand and think about the church as God thinks about it. Not as the people around the corner think about it. Not so much just how the Baptists or the Anglicans or the Methodists think about it. Not even how the government thinks about it. We want to think about the church, how God thinks about it. And if we get our thinking about the church as God thinks about it, then in all likelihood we'll find it's the most exciting, wonderful, incredible bunch of people to belong to. What other society in the world can compare with this fantastic people called the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ? Can you compare that with the rabbit keepers club or the beekeepers or the socialists or the Tories? Or, it's nothing to compare with the wonder of belonging to the people of God in this earth, seeking to live in God's earth, God's way, as we run around the earth demonstrating that we belong to him. That is the most fantastic crowd of people to belong to. You can say amen. I heard a hallelujah there. Keep it going. One out of 3,000 isn't bad. Keep going. <laughs> I love audience participation, you know. They really, when they worshipped in the Old Testament days, I've told some of you before, I'm sure, they really threw everything into it. They, you know, suppose they're living up in Galilee or across the Jordan somewhere, and they look along their, along their stalls and they pick out the biggest, fattest, ugliest bull they've got. They'd yank it out, baby would slap it with a spade, mother would push it in the back, father would pull it with a, with a rope, and for three days, blood, toil, tears, sweat. And they would stagger down to Jerusalem. As they were getting near Jerusalem, the bull would see the golden temple shining in the distance. And he began to get a bit worried. <laughs> and he would buck and he'd pull in his push. And you'd hold him back and you'd pull his tail and you'd drag him onto the road again. And you'd get him into the city and to the temple. And he's got through the temple doors, but he's got away. He's running around. He's kicking over the money changers' tables. He's jumping on the doves. He's chasing the priests. It's really exciting, this kind of worship. And We've got him, and he's onto the altar, he's off the altar, he's on the altar. The priest is coming with a knife, he's off again. The priest attacks, Whew. got him there. Now that was Old Testament worship. <laughs> In the New Testament, we're not half so excited about anything at all. <clears throat> we sit there for an hour on a Sunday morning watching the pimple go up and down on the back of somebody's neck. <laughs> and somebody tries an occasional, amen. <laughs> or you might be just really going over the top and somebody says, hallelujah. <laughs> but worship is for every particle of the human being. Like David dancing before the Lord, every particle, every cell, every corpuscle, bouncing up and down, 
glorying in the God of the universe. Where is honor and dignity for a scrap of little dust and flesh called a human being when it's in the presence of the Almighty God? Oh God, fill our worship with activity, energy, power. You may talk to me as I preach. That's all I was really saying, but that's wasted enough time for me to take my watch off and remember the problem. Oh, there is a clock here. There's also a red light. It was on when I began, just to encourage me. <laughs> but I spotted where the switch was, and my friend Gerald's got his foot ready to put it on it when it goes on again. <laughs> this is just introducing the epistle. The Apostle Paul, in AD 48, tried to preach in Bithynia, tried to preach in Mycenae, tried to preach down in other parts of Asia. That's in the area of Turkey. And the Holy Spirit kept checking him and leading him. And he knew he had to preach where God wanted him to preach. And he reaches a place where he gets a dream, a vision. A man of Macedonia come over from Asia to Greece. And he travels over that small stretch of water, lands in Kavala, which is still there today, and starts on the Via Ingen uh, Ignatia, which is a pathway, it's a place that I've had the privilege, 1,922 years was it later, to put my feet on and say to myself, I'm walking where the Apostle Paul walked. I loved it. But then you see, I'm one of those emotional kind of guys and I, you know, I just can't help it. I just get excited about these things. And then we got to some ruins and it's called Philippi. Of course, nobody's living there now. But you can see the reconstruction of that great city as it was, a colony of Rome, named after the famous father of Alexander the Great, Philip of Macedon. And you look around and you can see something of the glory, despite the fact it's ruined, you can see that there was a glory there before that's now lost. Just like the world in general, really, as you look around with all the problems and the suffering, you can look around and say, there was a glory here that somehow has been lost. It's like that. But you can find a place which was certainly the prison. <clears throat> because, you see, Paul got thrown into prison, as usual. It always happened this way. He finished up his campaign in Philippi in prison, but there was an earthquake, and it, the chains fell off, and the prisoners didn't escape, and, oh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved. You remember the story, don't you? Acts chapter 16. And on that building, you can actually see a crack right across the building that they reckon was the prison cell. I wonder if that came from the earthquake that shook the chains off the Apostle Paul. Well, I sat there romancing and I thinking, oh, it's wonderful, the chains dropped off, my heart was free. Then we went outside the town and there's a river running outside. There's only one, so it's pretty obviously the one that Lydia was baptized in. And there was a great slab of rock and there's some gypsies there washing their clothes and we went down there, they moved away a bit, but it was the obvious way to get into the river without sort of falling in or paddling through a load of mud. So we got into the river and there I baptized two people where the Apostle Paul baptized Lydia. It must have been. There wasn't anywhere else in the river that was quite sort of so suitable. It, uh, it really, I might even have my feet just where Paul had them. I, I, you know, I just, well, I kind of hoped. It was terrific. And I was full of it and we were driving home, coming through Yugoslavia and we were up to Nice the next day. This was my little boy ran across the road and got hit with a lorry. Chris was only five, he'd been in the loos that, you know, there's a little bit that could be done for them, really. But he'd pulled the chain, and instead of the normal sort of flush of water, it just filled up the whole of the toilets. And he was rather thrilled at this idea and came over to tell me. Well, I mean, you would have been too if you'd been in the same position. <laughs> five years of age. And he comes running across, and this lorry hit him on the head, and he goes up in the air. I can see every single detail of it. He's forgotten all about it, but I've dreamt about it even since. And he fell on the ground. I wondered, would he live? He screamed, he cried, so oh, he's alive still. We sat up all night watching for eyes to dilate or for uh, any evidences, sickness, that there was brain damage. And I sat there saying, I came out here to preach the gospel. I came out here to serve Jesus. And I brought my family and I've exposed them. And uh, am I doing the right thing? And uh, am I being a responsible father? You know the sort of things? Have you ever been through that? Look, brothers and sisters, in the final analysis, I don't say that you're walking into trouble because I believe that we have the protection of the blood of Jesus and we've got everything going for us. 
But you know, we've got to be prepared that if we start going out after the Lord and getting this good news throughout the whole of the world, we will not always be avoiding trouble. The enemy won't like it. Circumstances are not easy. Sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's your own fault, you don't think about things, sometimes it's just the circumstances of life. But there's got to be something to pay when you start to take this good news into all the world. That was Philippi for me, and I've been thrilled with the place, and it's also left great memories on me. I should tell you, of course, that Chris obviously lived. We had a load more escapades with Chris. Bringing up kids, you need a lot of love and a lot of prayer and a lot of tears. It's the only way to do it. But we, he's still chugging on. I'm waiting for my second grandson now, which you're not the slightest bit interested in, really, but I am, and I, I just keep thinking about it. So, or maybe a granddaughter, who knows? Maybe we have a son and a daughter, but you, you don't, you're not interested in that, so I, I better push on. But of all this, Paul now lands up, it's a good few years later, 12 to 14 years, and he's in Rome, and they've heard that he's in Rome, and the Philippians send this gift through Epaphroditus, he goes and sees Paul, and Paul is thrilled that they remembered him, just because they know, he knows it means they're going on with Christ and they're sowing for eternity. And then Epaphroditus was sick. And he's concerned about that. That's another reason why he wants to write and send Epaphroditus back, because although he was sick nearly to death, in actual fact, he has recovered. And he wants the Philippians to know this. So he's sending Epaphroditus back. And that's the circumstance in which these, this wonderful letter of God's heart, this love letter from God to man through Paul, has come to the Philippians, and now it comes out to all of us. There are just some other themes, actually. Those are the various chapters and how we look at them each night. But you'll find that there are themes running through this book. There's this lovely theme of joy. It occurs 16 times in four chapters. Because even when Paul was put into the prison at Philippi, and they put him in the stocks, he was singing praises and hymns at midnight, having been beaten with an inch of his life. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you think that's terrific? Well, we've only got to get a little tiny thing going wrong. You know, we can't find a clean pair of socks, or your wife's got the wrong marmalade for breakfast, and we think the whole of the world's fallen in. Here's this man being beaten, flogged, thrown into prison in the stocks, and he thinks, how do I meet this situation? Praise your head off. Praise your head off, Silas. Come on, we're going to praise. And then the, the place rocks. It's not surprising. Joy, 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 joy. What is the great hallmark of the Christian church? Misery, seriousness, <laughs> sobriety. Isn't that the sort of church you go to? You go in there full of joy. Oh, we're going to worship this morning. You come out after a, after a hammering from, you know, various kinds of things. And, oh, Lord, oh, I feel terrible. Oh, wasn't that wonderful message? It really made me feel so hopeless in music. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is our strength. I want to suggest to you, if the Church of Jesus Christ discovers how when in prison in stocks to get joyful again and start praising, this world will be shaken. There will be more earthquakes. Let's get the Philippian message back into our hearts. To know Jesus is joy. He is joy of man's desiring. He is the one who fills the heart and sends it ringing no matter what the circumstances. That is the message. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. We work largely in the inner city. And if you go in the inner city and you preach that, you know, that good news that sounds like bad news, you know what I mean? Pre breathe it down people's necks. You breathe some negative and they fall under the next bus. and you know, It's terrible stuff. They've got enough miseries of their own down there in the inner city. They don't want the miseries of religion poured on them as well. They want the happiness that comes from putting their hands into the hand of Jesus, who's promised we can do all things in this epistle through Christ who strengthens us. Let's get happy about what it is we've got. I've got to go fast. I'm going taking too long with this introduction. You'll find that the word mind is used ten times to mind or have a concern. It doesn't mean your IQ and how cerebral you are. It means that you're thinking and using your mind in the right way. It tells us to put into our mind whatsoever's lovely, good, true, good repute, and, and, and so on. The trouble is, and I'm sad about this, terribly sad, particularly with teenagers, that they're having their minds filled up with quite the reverse from the videos that are being pumped out. Is it any wonder that we spend week after week after week after day after day after day trying to help people to get out of their insides what the devil's been pushing in from the outside? Let's get these things right out of our lives, brothers and sisters, because our mind, our mind 
is the very universe in which we live and move and have our being. And we've got to treat our minds properly. To have a humble mind as there was in Christ. To have you in my mind, says Paul, and my heart you dearly longed for and loved and he prayed for them. And to have a mind that was continuously being filled up with the heavenly calling, the high calling of God. Be minded of this one thing. So we're going to see mind. We're going to look at unity. That occurs in every chapter. And fellowship. The fellowship of the gospel. The fellowship of the spirit. The fellowship of Christ's sufferings. And the fellowship in the church whereby we enable one another to go on growing in Christ and proclaiming the good news. We won't look at those other acetates there because I must move on more precisely to the text. Amongst those other themes, and we can forget, we'll have, we'll have another acetate in a minute, but not the one that comes next. We're just explaining. Amongst these themes, of course, central to everything the Apostle Paul is saying is Jesus. You notice Paul doesn't preach a godianity, doesn't even preach a spiritianity. And he certainly doesn't preach a religion. He preaches a person. He preaches about Jesus. And in the first two verses, you'll notice, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Line after line, he is central on Jesus. My heart is full of Christ and longs its glorious matter to declare, sings Charles Wesley. And I don't think he's too far away from the heart of Paul. Because, you see, the Christ that we encounter in this epistle, and he will walk out of its pages by the power of the Holy Spirit if we let him do it, if we open our hearts wide. So we're doing it now, and I'm praying that that's what's happening, that the things that I say go right inside you. The things I talk about Jesus, actually you encounter them. Not just think about them, write notes about them. You can do that. You can go on doing that, both of you. But the, <laughs> but the reality of meeting and encountering the Lord Jesus and the things of his word and his kingdom as we talk about them, that is the way that the truth of the New Testament comes over in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just look at that lovely title. You've said it so many times. The Lord Jesus Christ, verse 2. Because the one we're dealing with is the one who eternally was Lord, who is eternally in the future to be Lord, but now has not only called the Lord God, but he is the Lord man who has taken manhood to himself and translated it back into the heavens and the one that sits on the throne as the eternal Lord is one who we have known in the person of Jesus, who is the second name, the Redeemer, the one who's paid in this life for our sins, for our redemption, who laid down his life for us, the carpenter of Nazareth, amongst other men, because they too had the name Jesus. He was just one Jesus amongst many, but his name's Saviour. Jesus, which was a common one in those days, now is the one that thrills our hearts as we think about the carpenter of Nazareth who enter into our experiences, our sufferings, our difficulties, our pains, our problems, had to wash socks, had to wash his face, had to enter into eating like we do and go through all the vicissitudes of this kind of human life that we're in. This is the one who has taken that body and has placed it upon the throne of the universe so that in the very heart of God tonight there is a man and that man, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus who died for us has still got the marks in his hands. That's the God we worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that that's your savior? Aren't you glad that's your redeemer? He's the one who's in the throne and he's the Christ because that word Christ means anointed anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was anointed before the world began in order to create the universe with the Father. He was anointed when he was here on earth and the Holy Spirit came on in his baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased and the Spirit was poured forth. He is the anointed one when he goes back to heaven and he was anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, sat down at the right hand of God and now as God's heart beats with a human heart, the Christ of heaven pours out that anointing so that as God's heart goes, eternal life, eternal life, eternal life, it pumps in the heart of a man, for man, 
for man. I was the carpenter of Nazareth. I know and experience all that humans go for. I am for you, not against you, for man. And as his heart pumps, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is pumped out of heaven in order that in this very tent tonight, all that we need from God, all that we need in the sympathizing Savior who has been in our condition and still is, he loves humanity so much, he's still got that body, he hasn't put it down, is pumping out to us in this very place by his Christy spirit. The Christ is giving all that you need, all that I need to receive with full hearts. Lord, make me what you want me to be. What is it you need from him tonight? My God, says Philippians, will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. From verse 3 to the end of this epistle, of this chapter, there are three sections in which the word gospel occurs six of the nine times it comes in these four chapters. It's a very gospelly chapter. Added to the six times where the gospel is mentioned are four places. One says, and preaching the word of God. And another says, and to proclaim Jesus Christ. And another says, and Christ is declared. And Christ was declared. So there are some ten times in, these, in this first chapter, ten times, where the gospel or the preaching of the gospel or the good news is declared. In fact, the whole of the chapter is about this great mission of the church to get the good news through the world. In the first 11 verses, or verses 3 to 11, you will see it says in verse 5 and 6, something about the day of Christ. And again in verse 10, until the day of Christ. Look, for instance, in verse 5. In view of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, I'm confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, that isn't so much the good work of becoming more and more like Jesus, although, of course, it includes that. It's our fellowship in the gospel, which God has begun, he will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. And then again, in this same section, which is emphasizing fellowshipping in the gospel, or again, you can see it in verse 7, my defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are fellowshippers of grace with me. It says in verse 10, that you may be preserved blameless to the day of Christ. The end objective of the proclamation of the gospel and our fellowship in the gospel and the good work of the gospel that God has begun within us is to reach the day of Christ. Of course, I'm emphasizing letting people know who God is, what is done in Christ, the intervention into the scene of time and space, and how Jesus died, rose again for our sins, and has gone back to heaven to give us his spirit and is coming again. The good news of Christ. That has got to be proclaimed. But as my friend Gerald often says, not only is it a preaching of the good news, it is a being of good news. Because that good news must be worked in our own hearts and lives. So that all over the earth, every man, woman and child who belongs to Jesus is in the great mission of the church. Which is to gospelize, to evangelize, to get the good news by life and by lip. By being good news, by preaching good news, right to the ends of the earth until the day of Jesus Christ. For this good news must be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. And we are called upon to have the objective set before us of the hope of the gospel, which is the appearing in glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The glorious appearing and the blessed hope is the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ, but that will not take place until we have evangelized with life and lip to the ends of the earth, into every nation. The movement that I have the privilege of belonging to, called AD 2000, has this great objective that by the year 2000, let every person be within reach of the gospel and every church, as every nation, have a church within it. 
And if we don't aim at something, we'll never reach it. We modestly add AD 2000 and beyond, just in case we don't quite make it by the year 2000. But if the church doesn't aim at it, it will never get there. If it begins to say, we must do what God has told us to do, then we will hasten the day of the Lord, says Peter. Hastening the day of the Lord by preaching good news in all the world, by praying in all the world and longing for Jesus' return, and for by practicing the, go the gospel in all its facets as we live it out one with another. That is the mission of the church. And the day of Christ is the day when Jesus will come again and it will be glory and it will be answers to all our problems and it will be the end of all the things that torment and irritate and challenge us and the things that make us say, Oh God, where are you? Why don't you come and change it? He will come when we've done our work. We need God to do that work. We need his spirit to do it. But if our objective is the day of Christ, it's because we want to see that day. Don't you? Don't you want to be around when he comes? Or don't you want to run into that? I've got so much I'd love to say, but I've got my eye on the watch. You've probably heard about the new curate down in Somerset, and they said to the church warden, now you're getting on the new curate, or are we like the new curate, he says. When he says, in conclusion, he do conclude. <laughs> but the vicar, ah, the vicar. When he says lastly, oh boy, does he last. <laughs> so lastly, in verse 12 to verse 26, where you get all this preaching of the gospel, like pre preaching of Christ, proclaiming the truth, there's a word that occurs twice. You see it in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater advance of the gospel. And you get the word advance again in verse 25. That is a word which means pushing through and hacking through and pressing on. Because the advance of the gospel requires energy and effort. It requires men of violence who will bring in the kingdom with power. Who will take the kingdom by force. Who will pray strenuously and will exert all that they've got into the business of getting Christ through the world. Forgive me, but the light isn't on yet, so I'm all right, unless the light's shining in such a way I can't see whether it's on or off. I could always take it out anyway, and that would save me from... Oh, thank you, you're being kind. Right here. From the year 500 to the year 1500, the Christian church did not advance territorially or numerically. The Nestorian church, which was counted by some as heretical, and I'm rather fond of them, went off to China but got pushed back as the Mughals swept right through Central Asia and the Turks and eventually that area was totally lost. North Africa was lost to the Muslims, we gained Scandinavia. The area in which the church covered and the number of people which had actually gone down during the period of the Black Death didn't change for a thousand years. Are you hearing me? For a thousand years there is no advance. Of course, a little bit here and a little bit there, lose a bit here, gain a bit there. But overall, there was no advance of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, we need to call upon each other and to join hands together to stand in this great struggle. Because Paul calls it a struggle in verse 27. A struggle to get the good news through this earth. Complacency in saying God will do it in his own time is just a total cop out of the obedience which called upon us in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are here to get that work done and if we're going to salvage the world and its problems, if we're going to do anything for the people of Yugoslavia, if we're going to do anything for the people who are being oppressed and, and people who are suffering these days, if we're going to do anything for the neurotic hospitals, if we're going to do anything in the ultimate end, it is the day of Christ and we've got to fight through to that end and see Jesus come again. That is what we're here for. And then Paul says there were some people preaching Christ out of pretense and some people with wrong ambitions and some people with party spirit. But he says, you know, I don't mind. I know I'm chained up here to four guards called Quaternions. I know that I'm here. It's nothing to do with mathematics. I know I'm chained up here, but I got a captive audience. And the whole Praetorian guard knows now because every four get changed every watch and they have to listen to me preach. They thought they were putting me in prison, that was going to stop the gospel, and Paul, that old preacher, we got him out of the way, now I can become top dog preacher. But Paul says, I'm still getting on with it. 
because he refused to let circumstances in any way destroy the possibility of preaching Christ in all the world. There were no closed doors to Paul. Wherever he was, Christ was going forth. When I first began preaching, and it's still much the same today, I preach so badly that I have to get captive audiences. It's the only way I'm keeping them here from getting up and going out when I'm preaching. I was preaching outside the Albert Hall to a, to a bus queue on one occasion, and, and uh, because it was captive, you see, it couldn't go away. It was waiting for the bus. <laughs> and Graham Kendrick comes down the other side playing his guitar with a big notice, wife and four children to support. <laughs> And the bus queue was the pincer movement from both sides decided that after all it wouldn't be captive, it would start marching. And it started marching down the earth's house march for Jesus began. <laughs> Paul was a captive there, chained up to the guards, getting them saved, and everybody in the Praetorian Guard, 9,000 of them all talking about Jesus. Wonderful! He said, I don't care that people are preaching from wrong motives. Of course people have preached from wrong motives. Everybody's motives need a good old clean up every now and again. We all need a bit of purging. But for goodness sake, brothers and sisters, stop criticizing one another. If somebody is making Jesus known in all the loveliness of the person of Christ and the wonderful work he's done for us on the cross when he rose again, say amen, say thank God, say we wish we had more of them. Say I'm glad they don't belong to our denomination. I'm glad you've got them because we want Christ preached no matter how in all the earth. Don't you? That's Paul's attitude anyway. Just a little quick thing to finish, because this light's been on for about a quarter of an hour now. <laughs> so I'll be fast. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Isn't that wonderful? For me to live, Christ, literally, in the Greek. To die, gain. Because a lot of people emphasize to die is gain. They're forever saying, oh, I'm, I want to go to heaven. I don't know whether I do want to go to heaven quite as much as Paul wanted to do. Perhaps I'm wrong about that. You see, I want to hang around here a bit more and get a bit nearer to the day of Christ, which will be heaven on earth anyway. And I've got a rough idea that when I got converted, I got a bit of heaven inside me, so I'm not so much keen about going to heaven because I've got there already. Some of you might want to go to heaven. We could help you. <laughs> of course, it would be wonderful in heaven to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. But while you've got your body here on earth, I can still serve you, says Paul. I can still encourage you, Philippians, for your sake I need to be here. And while we've still got our bodies here on earth, we've still got the opportunity to put the enemy on the run and to see all these ugly things that the devil's doing around us put under our feet and sort and light shine out into the world. Can't we? Cast out demons, heal the sick, preach good news. Let's get going and see the devil running. And don't want to go to heaven too quick. I mean, yes, when you get as old as me, you might want to go. But while, while you're here, pour everything, getting the gospel through the earth. And then if you do go to heaven, go like Paul. He's waiting in prison to hear whether he's going to be executed or not. Go as a martyr. You want to be a martyr, don't you? You, you don't want to sit around just waiting to die, do you? You know, sometimes I thought, now what would it be like? I'm sitting up in my bedroom there, my poor wife's running up and down the stairs with all the people coming in from outside to receive my, God bless you, my son, you know, here. I send them off. I thought, all right, wear my wife out anyway. I don't think, I, I don't think that'll do. It'd be far better to die with your boots on, wouldn't it? I mean, you've lived for Christ. For me to live is Christ. Wouldn't it be best to die as game? Wouldn't it be best to die for Jesus too? Hmm? I'm not getting much response at this point. <laughs> I think if we live for Jesus, we might just as well die for Jesus. And anyway, if we get on with pushing the gospel out towards the day of Christ and we get nearer and nearer, even if you do get martyred, you won't have to wait too long. The resurrection's only around the corner. <laughs> and one or two of us won't get sloshed up quite as quickly as the others and we'll go running on hard and the second coming will be there and we'll be together with the Lord. I mean, that's what it's all about. We've all got to die. Let's make use of our death and do something useful with it. Oh, Lord. Some people go on about these early Christians and the early church, and they say they got, there must have been psychological cases wanting to run into martyrdom. I'm not so sure they hadn't caught something that we've got to rediscover. There have been more martyrs in the 20th century for the Christian church than at any other time in the history of the church. More in the 20th century. Well, one last thing, lastly. No, in conclusion, else Pete will get worried. In conclusion. Paul goes on to say, 
It's given to you on behalf of Christ, verses 27 through to the end, 30. It's given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer or to endure for his sake. You see, they'd remember that when Paul preached in Philippi and cast out that demonic spirit from that fortune-telling woman, that all the business people there rose up against him to push him out and to put him down and get him into prison, get him beaten. I just want to use that as a symbol to finish with. I don't believe that a respectable church, I don't believe that an easygoing church, I don't believe that a church that is not willing to face up to conflict church, I don't believe a church which wants to be sweet and nice to everybody, including all those that are destroying the lovely and the good things in this life without even raising our voice. I don't believe that sort of church that never protests, never cries out, and never helps our neighbors to help their children. I don't believe that that sort of church will ever cause much trouble at all. But I don't think it's the church of Christ. The church that Paul's talking about is one that will persecute, which will mean that it will be persecuted, sorry. It will be one that upsets situations. It will be one that throws out demons and the whole occult trade begins to collapse and the devil doesn't like it and he'll hit back. But in the end, it's the only real church and it's the only church that's worth belonging to. Of course, it's given to us to believe on Christ. Thank you, Jesus. We can trust you. It's a miracle. It's a wonderful gift. But it's also given to us on behalf of Christ to suffer for his sake. The Lord is calling us to endure, to get a little bit of grit inside us to say, I want to go for Jesus and whatever is happening in the rest of the world. I want to see this good news carried in the earth. I want the day of Christ to arise. And thank God that Jesus' name is being made known in all the earth and we're making advance and we're pushing forward and we're hacking our way through. That's the kind of church I want to belong to and it's the kind of church that God intends. And the end product will be that whether we run hard and find one day we've run so hard we've run into the arms of Jesus because the day of Christ has arrived and he's come again. Or we run hard and suddenly we wake up and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Whatever way round, it's going to be more than worth it, not only now, not only then, but right the way through eternity to be able to say, for me to live and to live forever and ever is Christ. And whatever I've given up, been persecuted, suffered, or even died is gain. And that's the way that I want to go in the church of our Lord. Are you going with me? Let's go on it together. Amen.